Everyone, we are on YouTube live now. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 47th webinar from iBreast Book. It's uh, conference updates again. We try to do this at least uh, once a year just to keep everybody updated with what's happening around the world. We have great faculty and great uh, uh, speakers and panelists. I'm not sure if the chat function is working. If the chat function is working, please uh, put some messages there. Yeah, I can see it now. Sorry for that. Yeah. We have a couple of hundred people online already. We have about 1,200 registered, so expecting to hit 400, 500 people online. If you have any question, please put it on the Q&A section that, so that we can see it. You will all get certificates sent to you uh, with CPT points by the College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, as usual. Uh, if you want to listen to things in Spanish, we have the lovely Ricardo Pardo again, and Ricardo is already starting to translate everything in Spanish. So for people that want to listen to everything in Spanish, click on the globe, choose the Spanish channel, and Ricardo is with you. Now we have three talks about, three updates about three great uh, conferences. The first is by Ramsey Catres from the UK about the Association of Breast Surgery in the UK conference, a great meeting. You need to come and visit us next year, hopefully in Bournemouth when, when this happens. Then we have Prof. John Benson from Cambridge going to give us an update about San Antonio uh, Breast Cancer Symposium, which is also another great uh, meeting. And we have Michael Gennant uh, from Austria and Michael is the co-chair of uh, St. Gallens and he's going to give us the update. Michael is uh, between flights between Dubai and Qatar, so hopefully we'll be able to join live. If he cannot, we have a recorded talk. For the panelists, we have uh, Nikki Roche, one of the surgeons from the Marsden, and Nikki is the meeting secretary for the Association of Breast Surgery. So all the good work that Ramsey is going to update us about is uh, really Nikki's uh, mastermind. And we have Sana al Sukhun, one of the oncologists from Jordan. And Sana is going to keep us all surgeons uh, uh, <laughs> sorted and just keep us all right. And we have the lovely Bahadir Guluglu from Turkey. And it's great to have Bahadir again with us today. So we'll start with the first talk. And the first talk will, will, will be from Ramzi Katris. And Ramzi is going to give us an update on ABS conference. Ramzi. Thank you, Yasan. Um, can I just double check that it's all the slides are displaying now? So they're displaying. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk and give the update uh, on the ABS conference. Um, this took place between the 15th and 16th of May at the ICC in Belfast. Uh, you can see the conference uh, program there. It's a very nice setting. You can't quite see that just to the left. Uh, of the conference center is uh, is the river da down the bottom. Uh, uh, you've got Southampton, where I'm uh, from. So the the conference was very well attended. There were over 800 people registered. There was a mix of uh, plenary sessions uh, and also submitted papers. And I'll I will select out a mixture of. Uh, of these. Uh, there was uh, also oral and poster prizes and I'll give you uh, I'll give you a summary of those two prizes. Uh, the, there are presentations available to ABS members. So if you'd like to join ABS, uh, you have access to the to the presentations on the website uh, and the abstracts are published uh, in the, in the May issue of the EJSO. So, uh, the first uh, that that looking through the what was uh, in the conference, the main themes. There was a lot. Uh, it's a surgical conference, so not surprisingly, there was a lot uh, on surgery. Uh, covered topics such as the axilla, margins, autologous reconstruction, aesthetic surgery, and a session from the Society of Irish Breast Surgeons. Uh, there were a number of sessions on survivorship covering local, local recurrence, lymphedema, menopause and HRT. And there was quite a lot on large data sets, particularly national uh, data. So national audits, meta-analyses, national cancer outcomes, uh, and, a, and uh, a talk on the getting it right first time or GERF program in the UK. 
There were also sessions, unsurprisingly, on training, research and clinical trials updates. What I've done is I've selected out uh, particular uh, presentations. So very much my apologies uh, for the very many excellent presentations that aren't included in my talk. And also apologies uh, as I'm limiting myself to a one slide summary for each uh, session. So if I haven't covered, which is certainly impossible in a, uh, in, a, in a summary talk like update talk like this, if I haven't covered the full breadth of each uh, talk or session in my single slide update, again, my summary. But I will try to give you a flavor and what took what I took home to be some key messages and some interesting uh, presentations from the talk. Obviously, there were parallel sessions, so also I wasn't able to be at every session. The, the first session I'd like to talk about um, was on the axilla. The axilla uh, remains a, a subject of interest for surgeons, uh, as it has always been. Uh, Dr. Isabel Rubio uh, from Madrid uh, gave an excellent uh, plenary talk on this. One of the points uh, she made extremely well is that sentinel node biopsy is becoming less important with time for staging, particularly given the increasing use of genomic assays uh, being used as the biological basis to determine systemic treatment. So in a way, uh, the Biological features are becoming uh, increasingly important uh, uh, in relation or in comparison to the staging <coughs> information provided uh, by sentinel node biopsy. Despite advances in axillary conservation, lymphedema remains a significant issue for patients, particularly following uh, either axillary dissection or nodal radiotherapy. And there's an ongoing imperative for de-escalation. One of the strategies discussed um, that she felt uh, was, was something that should be considered in clinical trials uh, is, is, for, uh, is in the setting of primary surgery, so surgery without neoadjuvant treatment, so surgery first, uh, and a clinically negative axilla, uh, the, the, the scope uh, and the position of uh, targeted uh, axillary dissection in those with less than three involved nodes, uh, whereas it was felt that in greater than three nodes, axillary uh, clearance remains uh, are probably uh, an appropriate option. This is something that it was felt would be suitable for further evaluation in clinical trials. It was, however, felt that sentinel node biopsy uh, has been shown to be safe uh, in clinically uh, in the clinically negative uh, axilla uh, following uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Gurdeep Manu. Uh, who is a clinical lecturer uh, in Oxford, uh, prov provided a really fascinating uh, analysis, EBC-TCG. Those of you will know the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group meta-analysis uh, on axillary treatment. Uh, this is the first presentation uh, of this meta-analysis data. Uh, my summary from the talk uh, is when a comparison was made comparing all randomized trials of more versus less axillary treatment um, with the first loco regional event uh, as the endpoint, no differences were seen uh, in studies from the pre sentinel node or the sentinel node era. Uh, so, so there were no clear differences. There was, however, heterogeneity in the site of local regional relapse. With, with more treatment, there were slightly fewer, local, there were uh, seen to be fewer local regional relapses um, in the axilla or supraclavicular fossa or IMF nodes, but otherwise no differences. Uh, and as I said, no differences overall. <clears throat> 
There was no subgroup identified in the Sentinel node biopsy trials with higher loco regional recurrence rates. So there was no subgroup identified where Sentinel node biopsy wasn't appropriate uh, out of those studied in the trials, and no statistically significant difference uh, in loco regional recurrence at 10 years found between axillary radiotherapy and axillary clearance. Again, uh, a subject that uh, has uh, been and remains controversial, margins after breast conserving surgery. We had uh, talks from both Hiram Cody uh, and uh, Nigel Bundred, uh, and the, the, the discussion mostly centered uh, around invasive disease with or without DCIS. Obviously, DCIS uh, alone is dealt with, uh, is, is analyzed separately in most of the studies. Um, a, a comparison was made by Nigel Bundred uh, of the BMJ 2022 meta-analysis uh, and also the prior Husami meta-analysis. Both studies demonstrated, and there were uh, and there was agreement that tumor on ink is not a sufficient uh, margin. Both analyses had, however, showed uh, that close margins were associated with worse outcome. However, the oncological significance of close margins uh, and the exact margin threshold required uh, was uh, uh, and continues to be debated. My personal view uh, is that uh, when uh, considering close margins, uh, one should also consider the absolute risk of recurrence. There are other factors that determine local recurrence, uh, but margins uh, remain important. Bait Kim uh, discussed uh, and gave us a summary of the Marika study that he uh, is chief investigator for. This is a study of loco regional recurrence in breast surgery. The study is important because guidelines and high quality research data for the optimal management of loco regional recurrence is lacking. And also, uh, loco regional recurrence, particularly with increasing breast conserv conservation, remains important. He summarized the national practice survey that was published in the EJSO in 2022 which showed that in UK practice for loco regional recurrence, the, the offer in uh, loco regional recurrence of breast conservation was dominantly affected by prior radiotherapy history. So in those who have had prior radiotherapy for their index first cancer, uh, it was much less likely that they would be offered uh, a second uh, breast conservation. Whereas in those who had not had radiotherapy, uh, breast conservation was much more frequently offered uh, as the operation uh, following loco regional recurrence as an option where appropriate. With prior uh, breast conservation and sentinel node biopsy, sentinel node biopsy was uh, offered as a repeat procedure by the majority of surgeons. Chemotherapy continues uh, to be offered uh, with loco regional recurrence in uh, triple negative patients, uh, and there is trial evidence to support that, uh, and also in those with node positive, uh, ER positive disease, so, so it's, uh, with the loco regional recurrence. The Marika study is recruiting really well. It's a current prospective study to determine the oncological outcomes and evaluate prognostic factors uh, in patients with loco regional recurrence. And about 400 out of the 500 patient target has been recruited from 40 centers across the UK. Professor Arnie Hill from Dublin gave a fascinating presentation on his view of the future of breast surgery. <clears throat> One of the key points he was making is that with neoadjuvant therapies, as pathological complete response rates rise, uh, we will be performing less surgery, particularly for HER2 positive disease. This is due to more effective and newer generation anti-HER2 therapies. This is going to become more common uh, also, uh, although 
possibly not as quickly in triple negative disease with newer therapies such as immunotherapies and alaparib, but we do need to better understand how to identify those who have a complete result, complete response, uh, and in whom we can more safely uh, consider de-escalation uh, of surgical treatments. Uh, and he discussed some of the work of Henry Kerr. He also felt sentinel node biopsy was likely to become less important for staging uh, and performed less in the elderly. And again, this was similar uh, to uh, Isabel Rubio's point. And he felt that there was likely to be more surgery for gene carriers. Uh, this is particularly uh, felt to be the case given that uh, genetic testing is likely to become more widespread uh, and cheaper. He also more speculatively raised the question as to whether robotic surgery uh, might be something uh, that was more widely taken up in the future. Professor Kieran Horgan uh, gave us uh, a, a, an update from the National Audit of Breast Cancer in Older Patients, the NABCOP audit, particularly focused on re-excision surgery. Between 2014 and 2019, over 18,000 patients aged greater than 50 uh, had breast conservation as their initial surgery. The reoperation rate varied with age and between units. However, for invasive cancer, there was very little difference between 2014 and 2019, uh, and it remained at between 14% four, in 2014 and 12% in 2019. The re-excision rate uh, for DCIS reduced very slightly from 27% uh, to 23% uh, over the time period. And it was felt that for both those uh, metrics, there was considerable variation uh, and also that the re-excision rates remain high. It was uh, <coughs> uh, pointed out that out of the re-excisions overall, 21%, so one-fifth of re-excision sur surgery, is consistently a mastectomy uh, rather than uh, a re-excision of margins. The predictors of who uh, was likely uh, to require re-excision uh, included those uh, with a larger tumour size uh, and involved uh, lymph nodes, perhaps not surprisingly. However, Gray did not obviously predict that, whereas in contrast for DCIS, GRADE was a predictor for re-excision surgery. He felt that an appraisal uh, of reoperative surgery uh, was, uh, would be timely to see if these rates can be reduced. Again, my second slide uh, on Mr. Gurdu Manu. Uh, he gets a second slide because he won uh, the, 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 the overall prize for the oral presentation at the conference, and he presented data on symptomatic DCIS in England. This uh, He had previously published in 2020 in the BMJ data on screen-detected DCIS across England between 1988 and 2014. Uh, and this is the non-screen-detected DCIS cohort of more than 27,000 uh, patients between 1990 and 2018 that he presented. By the end of 2018, uh, in 11% uh, of patients, invasive breast cancer uh, had developed uh, and in 18% of patients, uh, breast cancer was the cause of death. This is higher than the rate seen in the general population by approximately threefold. The risk of invasive uh, breast cancer was found to be marginally higher after non-screen detected DCIS compared to the screen detected DCIS cohort, uh, again showing the slightly better outcomes seen uh, in a screen detected cohort. After breast conservation, invasive breast uh, uh, cancer rates were similar 
plus minus radiotherapy. However, this is an observational cohort study uh, and the question as to the benefits uh, of radiotherapy is, is better addressed by the randomized trials, for example, the meta-analysis published in, 2020, in 2010 by the EBC-TCG. However, the rates uh, of future invasive breast cancer was lower following mastectomy. Data from the Million Women study, particularly relating uh, to HRT, uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, presented by Professor Gillian Reeves from Oxford. Uh, she showed data demonstrating a convincing evidence of an adverse effect of HRT use on breast cancer risk. This depends on the type and duration of HRT use. And as an overall estimate, 10 years of combined uh, use when compared to non-users uh, doubles the future breast cancer risk. By comparison, uh, in those with BMI greater than 30 compared to those with BMI uh, less than 25, the increased risk is about 1.5 fold or, or 50%. There was also an increased risk of ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer seen in this study uh, with HRT uh, use. She showed us some unpublished data demonstrating uh, an increased risk uh, of uh, breast screening interval cancers, uh, possibly, possibly due to an uh, uh, increase in mammographic uh, density, uh, uh, reducing sensitivity. Uh, there was also uh, an increased uh, breast cancer mortality risk seen uh, in uh, current users of HRT use. Uh, this was published previously in The Lancet uh, and reduces with time following cessation of HRT. The winner of our poster prize uh, was uh, Kit Fairhurst, who uh, is an NIHR academic clinical lecturer, uh, and she looked at what happened uh, in the Restore C study to patients who were not offered immediate breast reconstruction during the COVID pandemic. Uh, this was done through qualitative uh, interviews. Out of those uh, people, uh, about uh, one third had decided against immediate breast reconstruction. One third were waiting for or had had uh, a delayed breast reconstruction uh, and one third uh, received or were opting uh, for contralateral uh, mastectomy for symmetry. The themes uh, identified uh, were inadequate support during the COVID period, uh, a delay uh, in decision-making uh, seemed to affect the decision later on, uh, and that symmetry uh, was desirable beyond reconstruction, uh, thus highlighting the importance of support and access to breast reconstruction. There was a very uh, interesting uh, uh, submitted paper on the clinical component of triple assessment uh, presented by Dr. Farah Kazi from Dublin. Uh, in this paper, uh, she looked at the accuracy of clinical examination uh, through uh, an e-score uh, in a single centre. So that's the clinical score of the likelihood of malignant, malignancy uh, in Dublin. Uh, this was between 2018 and 2021, with over 23,000 periods over a four-year period. An e-score of one or two, so a clinically benign uh, uh, assessment, uh, had a cancer pickup rate of 0.4%. Whereas in E3 patients, so patients where the clinical assessment was indeterminate but felt probably to be benign, the cancer pickup rate was 2.4%. In those where the clinical examination was suspicious but not definite for malignancy, approximately one in four patients ultimately were found to have cancer whereas almost 90% of patients uh, where the clinician felt it was cancer did have cancer. So the sensitivity uh, of clinical examination was around 70% uh, in the, uh, was overall around 71%, but this varied with age. Uh, it was about 45% in the under 35s uh, and went up to 70 almost 73% in the over 35s. So it was 
lower uh, with, with it, it, sensitivity was lower uh, in young patients. The specificity was consistently fairly high uh, of about 96%. Um, but it should be remembered when, when people, when very large numbers of patients uh, are, are being seen, uh, even a high specificity is not a complete guarantee uh, of not uh, missing disease. There was a presentation uh, on the diagnosis of BIA ALCL by Dr. Eddie Gibson, uh, who is a radiologist, uh, and this uh, described the UK uh, guidelines published in uh, EGSO. The point was made that less than 10 mils of peri-implant fluid is normal. The sensitivity of ultrasound uh, for a collection is greater than 80%, but the specificity for the cause is less than 50%. The effusion of BIA-ALCL is homogenous. Uh, inflammatory features and the thickened capsule may or may not be seen. Uh, we were reminded that dual implant, dual lumen implants can mimic fluid. MRI is helpful to exclude rupture and gel bleed and also for staging. Uh, and PET-CT is recommended for preoperative staging with confirmed ALCL. For diagnosis, as much fluid should be sent, uh, particularly for cytology, but also for microscopy uh, and diagnostic hematology. I'll briefly mention the ABS badged trials, uh, which all had a stand. Uh, and finally, uh, in conclusion, uh, again, apologies to those who've worked and talks I have not covered, uh, and also apology to those uh, who I have summarized uh, their talks into one slide. Uh, for me, it was a very uh, enjoyable conference. I'd recommend people uh, uh, think about and be very welcome to come to future ABS conferences. As yes, Anne said, the next one uh, in Bournemouth by the sea. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to present. That's great talk, Ramsey, and it's it's, it's lovely summary of uh, of the conference and it's great to have the mastermind behind this conference, Nikki, with us today. So we'll take the questions later after we finish all the uh, all the uh, presentations. And if you have any questions, please put them on the Q and A yes. section. I can see some people raising their hand. Uh, if you have questions, please put it on the Q and A section and see how things go. Now. The ABS is mainly a surgical uh, congress and there's lots of uh, surgical studies and trials. Now we'll go to a more oncological type of uh, uh, conference, which is the San Antonio uh, Breast Cancer Symposium that happened in December last year. And the best person to give us an update on, on this is always Prof. John Benson. John has done that with the trainees in the UK for a few, on a few occasions. He always gives a beautiful update on that. So John, the next 20 minutes are all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Yazid. It's a great pleasure to be invited to take part in this uh, iBreastbook uh, webinar, and it's wonderful to have so many people uh, tuned in from around the world. So um, I have no uh, conflict of interest or disclosures. So I'm going to be talking about the 45th annual San Antonio uh, Breast Cancer Symposium, which took place between the 6th and the 10th of December uh, 2022. Uh, more than 9,000 clinicians and scientists from 80 countries uh, around the world uh, participated uh, with 1,600 abstracts uh, accepted for poster presentation. Now, the San Antonio meeting is uh, notable for having no parallel sessions. Uh, there are a range of presentations and keynote talks uh, which cover breast cancer screening and prevention, uh, local regional and systemic therapies, uh, and basic science and translational medicine. And a novel feature um, of last year's meeting was the interspersion of educational sessions with the general sessions rather than these preceding uh, the start of the main meeting. So that was interesting, uh, interestingly quite a, a significant change for me having attended the meeting uh, for the past 20 years or so. 
So um, I'm going to give you a sort of snapshot of um, presentations, which I think, you know, are important and potentially practice changing uh, in particular. So I'm going to start with um, a presentation from Yara Abdu uh, from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And she provided further data confirming worse breast cancer outcomes amongst ethnic minority groups. And she cited the 4% lower incidence of uh, breast cancer in black women in the United States, but a 40% uh, higher mortality. So she analyzed clinical data within the Rx Ponder trial in terms of race and ethnicity, and there were four racial groups, non-Hispanic whites, Asians, Hispanics, and Blacks. And the Rx Ponder trial, just to remind you, it examined the value of the 21 gene recurrence score uh, in node positive patients who were hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, and it showed there was no benefit from chemotherapy in postmenopausal women with a recurrence score of 25 or less. But for premenopausal women with one to three positive nodes, uh, these did derive benefit um, with a recurrence score of less than. Uh, of 25 or less. Um, overall, the study found there was no significant difference amongst the racial subgroups for the 21 gene uh, recurrent scores, nor for tumor type, uh, and the number of positive nodes. Uh, just to remind you here about the um, stratification within the randomization arm. So there was stratification based on recurrent score, uh, menopausal status, and the type of auxiliary surgery. And then patients were randomized either to chemotherapy uh, with endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. Uh, just to remind you of the results here. So the invasive uh, disease-free survival um, at five years was um, significantly improved uh, when chemotherapy was given to premenopausal women, uh, but there was no benefit for postmenopausal women with one to three positive nodes uh, and a recurrence score of 25 uh, or less. So it was found that Blacks and Hispanic patients had significantly a greater chance of having high grade tumours and higher BMI scores. There was a worse invasive disease-free survival at five years uh, for non-Hispanic Blacks uh, compared with non-Hispanic Whites, and I've shown the figures there. Also, interestingly, there were very high levels of compliance um, with endocrine therapy, uh, with 96% of Blacks and 94.8% of non-Hispanic uh, white patients remaining on endocrine therapy at 12 months of follow-up. So it was uh, hypothesized that uh, differences in clinical outcomes are unlikely related uh, to issues of compliance. Um, and these probably more are more likely to reflect innate biological differences, and it's important to analyze genotype uh, in relation to race, and in particular uh, to look at ancestry associated gene expression profiles. Uh, there was a very brief allusion to lower progesterone levels in non Hispanic blacks and a phenomenon of ethnic uh, neutropenia. So uh, moving on, um, there are problems of long-term toxicity and lack of adherence with ovarian function um, suppression. Uh, this is usually recommended for women under 35 years of age who are considered uh, to be at sufficiently high risk for receipt of chemotherapy. There's a need for individual risk-based uh, methods uh, for determining receipt of accelerated hormonal therapy in premenopausal women. And Ruth Regan from the University of Rochester in New York, um, she examined the breast cancer index um, and found that this does evaluate the risk of late distant recurrence at five to 10 years after diagnosis in hormone receptor positive patients uh, with early stage uh, breast cancer. Uh, the breast cancer index incorporates uh, the, a gene expression signature called the molecular grade index, and also something called the HI ratio, which some of you may or may not have come across. And this is an expression of the Hox13 gene, 
seen the ratio of that gene expression to IL-17 uh, BR gene. Uh, and this predicts benefit from extended endocrine therapy, so it basically reflects uh, endocrine sensitivity. So um, Ruth uh, Regan, she used the breast cancer index to evaluate a subgroup of patients from the soft trial uh, receiving exomestane and ovarian function suppression uh, compared with those receiving tamoxifen uh, alone. And just to remind you of the outcomes within the soft trial, um, patients having tamoxifen um, had lower breast cancer-free survival rates than patients having uh, tamoxifen combined with ovarian function suppression. Uh, and there was uh, an improvement when you added in an AI to ovarian function suppression. So that was an advantage over uh, tamoxifen. So this index was found to have a uh, prognostic value at 12 years of follow-up, uh, in particular for patients who were node negative or had one to three positive nodes. Uh, a high score was associated with an increased risk of distant recurrence, uh, whilst a low score was associated with a reduced risk of recurrence in patients receiving ovarian function suppression. So interestingly, the benefit of ovarian functions from ovarian function suppression isn't necessarily related uh, to endocrine sensitivity, unlike extended endocrine therapy. And patients with endocrine resistant tumors and who have a low HI score appear to derive more benefit from ovarian function suppression. They have reduced uh, distant recurrence risk of uh, values of 7.3% compared with 11.6%, uh, and that is statistically significantly different. So the breast cancer index uh, might potentially be useful uh, to select premenopausal patients for ovarian function suppression. So uh, moving on to the Monarch uh, E trial, which examined the value of CDK46 inhibitor uh, in high risk uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative uh, breast cancer. Uh, this was presented by Steve Johnson from the Royal Marsden Hospital. Just to remind you that high risk is defined as four or more nodes positive or one to three positive nodes and at least a tumor measuring five or more centimeters. Um, histological grade three, or patients who have a key 67 value uh, of 20% or more. So patients within this trial um, underwent either primary surgery, uh, which were the majority, or neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and they received radiotherapy uh, and endocrine therapy as indicated. Uh, the primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival. Secondary endpoints included invasive disease-free survival amongst patients with high uh, key 67 expression. Uh, distant relapse-free and overall survival were also uh, secondary endpoints in this study. So at an interim analysis, after 323 invasive disease-free events and a median follow-up of 15 and a half months, uh, there was a, re a reduction in risk of invasive disease by about 25%, with a hazard ratio um, of uh, 0.74, and this represented a 3.5% absolute benefit uh, in favor of the CDK46 uh, inhibitor. And this is just shown graphically here where you can see this absolute dif difference um, of 3.5%, and that is uh, actually 24 uh, months. So, um, this updated analysis presented um, by uh, Professor Johnson um, looked at survival uh, and at at 42 uh, months follow-up, all patients had completed uh, treatment with a bemocyclib, and there was continued separation of the curves for invasive uh, disease-free survival, uh, with an increase in the absolute benefit uh, compared to earlier time points for all specified subgroups. So I've shown here uh, the figures of 3.5% at two years, 4.8% at three years, and 6.4% uh, at four years. Interestingly, key 67 was not predictive uh, of benefit from a CDK46 inhibitor. 
So there was this year-on-year -year increase in the magnitude of the absolute benefit, uh, and there was also, interestingly, evidence of a carryover effect and an overall proportional reduction in invasive disease-free survival of 34.1%. Now, this, the overall survival data uh, does remain immature, uh, but there is a suggestion of what was called a survival uh, signal. Uh, there were fewer deaths in the abemocyclib group compared with the control group. But I would point out here that there are quite significant adverse side effects uh, from CDK4-6 inhibitors. So if you look at the figures for diarrhea, you got 84% versus 9%, fatigue, 41%, versus 18%, and then neutropenia, 45% versus 6%. And actually, discontinuation of therapy due to adverse effects uh, was 18%. So I'm going to talk now about the um, series of uh, DESTINY um, studies. So um, Ian Kropp discussed the role of the breast O2 trial which was really a follow-on from the BRESTO-1 trial. And this uh, confirmed that the antibody drug conjugate trastuzumab deroxtican, which I'm here I'm going to refer to as TDXD, uh, this showed activity as third-line treatment for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. And that was a single arm open label phase two trial. So TDXD uh, was designed to provide optimal anti-tumor effects by delivering chemotherapy directly to HER2 positive uh, cancer cells. And the BREST-01 trial recruited 253 patients with unresectable uh, and or metastatic breast cancer. Uh, they were all confirmed to be HER2 positive on central archival tissue, uh, tissue, and they'd all had prior treatment with TDM1. And overall, the response rate uh, was 61% uh, based on central uh, imaging review. Um, and um, these were a group of very heavily uh, pre-treated uh, patients. So the DESTINY breast 2 trial was really a confirmatory randomized controlled trial uh, comparing TDXD with treatment of physician's choice after disease progression on TDM1. So they found there was improved progression-free survival uh, for TDXD uh, compared with treatment of physician's choice with really, you know, quite a significant difference of 17.8 months compared with 6.9 months and a hazard rate of 0.35. There was also prolongation of median overall survival uh, for the antibody drug conjugate, uh, 39.2 months versus 26.5 months with a hazard ratio of 0.65 um, and a small p-value. So TDXD uh, appears to be superior to treatment of phys physician's choice, which was usually uh, capecitabine with trastuzumab uh, or lapatinib, uh, and there's an acceptable side effect profile. And the main side effect here uh, is interstitial lung disease, which occurred with an incidence of about 10.4%. So moving on to um, something called the BRESTO-3 trial, um, this was really a direct head-to-head uh, -head comparison of the two antibody drug conjugates, uh, TDXD and TDM1. This was a randomized uh, phase three trial, um, a second line uh, treatment after progression on trastuzumab and a taxane uh, for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. And this was presented by uh, Sarah Hurwitz, and actually the results were simultaneously published in The Lancet on the morning of her presentation. Uh, just to show you here, um, the antibody drug conjugates, there's TDM1, um, and this, the um, cytotoxic payload here is an antimicrotubule agent, whereas, whereas for TDXD, uh, there's a topoisomerase uh, inhibitor. And a particularly interesting phenomenon with the antibody drug conjugates is that the cytotoxic payload is released before there's internalization um, of the antibody drug conjugate so that the cytotoxic payload can actually act on adjacent cells which may not contain 
or carry the receptor um, for the for the HER2. So this um, gives rise to something called the bystander effect. And, and I'll talk again about that when I'm talking about um, HER2 low uh, tumors, but it's a, a very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. So patients were randomly assigned to TDXD or TDM1 um, with progression-free survival as the primary endpoint. Um, Hervitz had reported previously on a dramatic 72% reduction in the risk of progression for TDXD compared with TDM1 uh, with a hazard ratio of only 0.28. And I've shown the uh, curves here and the very, very significant difference. So uh, in San Antonio last year, uh, she presented uh, an update of results um, with um, a 36% reduction in the risk of death. So this wasn't progression-free survival, it was actual risk of death. Um, and that was a very significant finding. Uh, they confirm a clear oncological benefit of TDXD over TDM1, again with mild to moderate severity uh, of interstitial lung disease. Um, and based on these findings, it's been recommended that TDXD should be the new standard for second line treatment of HER2 positive uh, metastatic breast cancer. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about something called the TALENT trial, which was a sort of exploratory trial, really, looking at neoadjuvant uh, trastuzumab, uh, deroxticam or TTXD, uh, combined with anastrozole for her too low hormone receptor positive early stage breast cancer patients. And up till now, um, anti uh, HER2 therapies have really only been used for HER2 low patients with metastatic uh, breast cancer. So just to remind you that HER2 negative uh, patients are not necessarily completely uh, zero. Uh, they may be HER2 one or plus or HER2 uh, HER2 two plus. Um, and I've alluded already to the bystander effect whereby the cytotoxic payload can act on neighboring cells which don't express uh, the monoclonal uh, antibody uh, receptor. So about two thirds of hormone receptor positive tumors express low levels uh, of HER2. And often this group of patients will be treated with combined anthracyclines and taxanes, uh, which is associated with considerable toxicity. And in particular, they have very low rates of complete uh, pathological uh, response. So Atidia Bardia from Massachusetts General Hospital, he evaluated the clinical utility and safety of neoadjuvant TDXD alone or combined with endocrine therapy. Uh, these were patients who were treatment naive with stage two and three breast cancer, more than two centimeters, uh, hor hormone receptor positive, HER2 low, half of them were lymph node positive, uh, and a third of them had grade three tumors. It was commented there was quite a lot of discordance with, uh, in the HER2 assays between local uh, and central laboratories, and there's a need for standardization of methods in terms of tissue collection uh, and, and processing um, and types of antibodies uh, which are used. Uh, so the primary endpoint of this study uh, was a PCR rate of um, 5% or more. So um, the data was relatively immature at the time it was presented, uh, and no patients uh, in the combination arm and just one patient in the monotherapy arm had achieved uh, a complete pathological response. But in terms of clinical responses, 12 out of 16 um, in the TDXD alone arm had a response, one of which was complete. Uh, and then there were 12 out of 19 with a response in the combined arm, two of which uh, were complete responses, but there was one patient with progressive disease uh, in that arm. So neoadjuvant TDXD has demonstrated clinical activity uh, as monotherapy or combined with endocrine treatment. 
Interestingly, there are dynamic changes in HER2 expression and about half of patients in response to treatment with TDXD, i.e. they change from being IHC 2 plus uh, to 1 plus or IHC uh, 1 plus uh, to 0. So HER2 low does seem to represent uh, a new entity, um, but there is some biological uh, inconsistency. Uh, it's very important to elucidate mechanisms of resistance um, which um, and develop combinatorial therapies which will prevent evasion, evasive action by cancer cells and ultimately improve clinical outcomes uh, and minimize uh, toxicities. So I'm going to move on to um, the positive trial, this is something which uh, moving away from medical oncology, you may be pleased to know. Um, so the ATLAS trial conf confirmed benefit at 10 years uh, versus five years for endocrine therapy uh, with tamoxifen in premenopausal patients. Uh, pregnancy is contraindicated uh, during pregnancy. Um, and now women are recommended to have 10 years uh, of endocrine therapy. So these researchers looked at temporary interruption of hormone therapy, um, say for a period of 18 to 30 months, which may permit uh, conception uh, and pregnancy uh, to term. So the positive trial was a prospective non-randomized study of premenopausal women who desired pregnancy after breast cancer. Uh, the trial recruited 518 patients from 116 centers in 20 countries around the world. World. The majority had stage one and two disease, a third were node positive, the median age was just 37 years, and 75% of patients uh, were nulliparous. So some safety analyses were undertaken, uh, which led to a predefined trial suspension threshold of 47 or more uh, breast cancer recurrences within three years of the median uh, period of follow-up. The primary endpoint was breast cancer-free interval uh, from the point of enrollment uh, to the first event. So there were a total of 44 breast cancer recurrences corresponding to a rate of 8.9% at three years. And this compared favorably with a figure of 9.2% for a comparative external cohort control within the SOFT uh, and the TEX trials. So three quarters of women uh, had at least one pregnancy, uh, with 86% of these uh, having at least one live birth. So 64% of the entire entire cohort had uh, one or more live births. There were uh, a, an acceptable incidence of um, birth defects um, and low birth weights, uh, the figures I've shown there. Um, there was a break of two years from endocrine therapy to allow time for breastfeeding. Uh, three quarters of women had resumed endocrine therapy uh, at 48 months unless they wanted to have a further pregnancy um, or wanted to continue uh, with breastfeeding. So it was concluded that temporary interruption of endocrine therapy uh, for pregnancy does, does not appear to negatively impact breast cancer outcomes uh, in the relatively short term follow up uh, for ER positive disease. Um, so these data suggest that patient-centered reproductive health care should be incorporated routinely in the care of young women uh, with breast cancer. So I'm just going to move on to something a bit surgical now. So there's a bit of controversy about the oncological safety of oncoplastic breast conserving surgery for multiple ipsilateral breast cancers. Uh, we generally have poor quality evidence from small retrospective series and anecdotal reports. Uh, with lack of details, particularly on radiotherapy techniques such as double boosts. So Judy Bowie um, from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester uh, undertook the ACOSOG uh, Z11102 trial, which was a single arm prospective study evaluating outcomes of oncoplastic breast conserving surgery and breast irradiation for patients with multiple ipsilateral breast cancers. And they recruited 204 uh, women, 40 years of age or over, 
with clinically T1 to 2 or N0 to 1 breast cancer, and they had to have two or three foci of disease within the breast, at least one of which had to be uh, invasive, and the tumor foci had to be separated by at least two centimeters, and each one had to be less than five centimeter in size. The median follow-up was 66.4 uh, months. So the primary outcome measure uh, was local recurrence at five years, um, and the defined acceptable rate uh, was 8% based on studies of unifocal tumors. Secondary outcomes included conversion to mastectomy, uh, which was 7.1%, uh, cosmesis, so about 70% of patients um, had uh, good or excellent patient reported outcomes at two years. Also, um, it was important to record uh, outcomes of double boosts, for example. So an increase in boost volume was associated with acute dermatitis, but not worse uh, cosmesis uh, at two years. So the majority of patients within this study did have mammography, ultrasound, uh, and MRI, but there was an amendment in 2015 uh, permitting recruitment without uh, MRI imaging. So in terms of results, uh, six patients developed local recurrence, um, and this yielded an estimated cumulative incidence at five years um, of 3.1%. Uh, uh, and the local recurrences were mainly within the breast, but there was one in the skin uh, and one on the chest wall. They did perform a subset analysis, which revealed lower rates of local recurrence amongst patients with um, a preoperative MRI, which I hasten to add was by far the majority of patients, only 15 did not have an MRI. But amongst those who had an MRI, the local recurrence rate was 1.7, compared with 22.6 uh, for those who did not have an MRI. Uh, but those figures are small. So there's a suggestion of a lower recurrence rate um, for luminal type uh, tumors, ER positive, HER2 negative, um, a local recurrence rate of 2.6%. Um, there were few patients with triple negative breast cancers and HER2 positive uh, tumors. So this study showed there was a reassuringly low rate of local recurrence for patients with multiple ipsilateral breast cancers treated with breast conservation therapy. Uh, MR MRI should probably be considered um, for, uh, in imaging patients with more than one foci of tumor on mammography and ultrasound, and many of us would, of course, do that. Um, further follow-up and additional studies are required uh, to confirm that there are lower rates of local recurrence for luminal-type tumors, and also whether rates of local recurrence are acceptable for triple-negative breast cancers, HER2-positive tumors, and also what is the optimal surgical procedure here? Should we do we be doing uh, you know, two wide local excisions, as I've shown here, or should we be doing some sort of um, therapeutic uh, mammoplasty to deal with these tumors, or in fact, a chest wall perforator flap? So um, I'm getting to the end of my presentation. I want to uh, mention this um, study by the Oncoplastic uh, Breast Consortium. So we know that neoadjuvant chemotherapy potentially downstages 40 to 50% uh, of nodal disease overall, and up to 70% of phenotype appropriate cases. Uh, the false negative rate for sentinel lymph node biopsy following neoadjuvant chemotherapy generally exceeds 10%. It's between 12 and 15% in most studies is, but it is minimized by the use of dual traces for sentinel node localization, uh, retrieval of three or more nodes, uh, and resection of any biopsied uh, or clipped node uh, with sentinel node biopsy, as in a targeted auxiliary uh, dissection. Uh, there's some controversy about the need for targeted auxiliary uh, dissection, um, but um, it is widely practiced, but it can be difficult to ensure that at least three nodes uh, have been removed Moved if you don't perform uh, clipping. So we generally have minimal data on long-term oncological outcomes of auxiliary uh, de-escalation for YPN0 uh, tumors, and it's important to undertake audit and registration studies uh, pending results of the uh, NSABP B51 um, trial and trials such um, as ACNEC. Uh, 
So the OPBC04 uh, trial, uh, this was a retrospective analysis of uh, prospective databases for multiple institutions. It was a very international study. Uh, the study period was April 2013 uh, to December 2020. Um, patients were recruited with biopsy proven uh, clinically node positive tumors, T1 to 4, uh, N1 to 3 breast cancer. Um, all patients underwent sentinel lymph node biopsy or a targeted um, axillary uh, dissection. They didn't have formal um, axillary lymph node dissection, uh, and they all had an axillary uh, PCR. So the study aimed to uh, document um, rates of axillary, loco-regional, and any invasive recurrence uh, with comparison in particular of axillary recurrence for each of the surgical um, methods for staging uh, the axilla, namely sentinel node biopsy, uh, compared with targeted axillary dissection. Um, so you can see here uh, the numbers uh, in each group, um, 666 for sentinel node biopsy, 470 for the targeted axillary dissection group. Um, there was a clip placed in about a quarter of those who had uh, sentinel node biopsy, but this wasn't formally um, sort of targeted uh, during surgery. Um, and um, obviously 100% of those in the targeted axillary dissection group had a, had a clip placed. Um, the majority of patients had radioactive seed localization um, and about a quarter had wire localization. Uh, this shows the number of sentinel nodes uh, retrieved, uh, very comparable for each group. Uh, you'll note that quite a lot of these patients did receive uh, nodal irradiation uh, because none of, the, none of these patients had a formal axillary lymph node dissection, so it's probably not unreasonable. There were high rates of nodal irradiation. Um, and, um, you know, the receipt of um, adjuvant chemotherapy was uh, relatively low. So the overall cumulative incidence of axillary recurrence at three years was 0.65%, uh, uh, and in particular, it was 0.5% for targeted axillary dissection and just 0.8% uh, for sentinel uh, lymph node biopsy. So there was no statistically significant difference uh, between the two, uh, similarly for rates of local regional uh, recurrence, which I won't dwell on. So there were some limitations of this retrospective study uh, with potential biases, but results are supportive um, of the trend for axillary de-escalation in patients um, who have our biopsy proven node positive uh, prior to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, it supports de-escalation um, for clinically N1 patients with radiological evidence of a complete response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Interestingly, the study didn't specifically address uh, the significance of isolated tumor cells uh, in sentinel nodes. And it's also unclear from what was presented whether any of the cases of auxiliary recurrence occurred in any of those cases uh, for which the CLIP was not successfully uh, retrieved. So um, I'll skip over that slide in the interest of time. I'm just going to finish by talking about uh, this interesting trial of conventional versus hyperfractionated uh, post-mastectomy proton radiotherapy uh, presented by Robert Mutter from the Mayo Clinic. So um, proton beam therapy is a type of radiotherapy which employs high energy protons rather than photons. It reduces the dosage to normal tissues. It permits organ sparing and more accurate coverage of target structures uh, containing the malignant lesion. Uh, there's no statistically increased risk of complications generally using this uh, technique, uh, but it is very, very expensive. And there are a few sites, certainly in the UK, uh, which can offer this treatment. So there's very limited data on the use of hypofractionated proton regimens uh, in breast cancer patients. Uh, and this randomized uh, trial uh, did include um, patients who had uh, breast reconstruction. So this randomized um, patients uh, with mastectomy with or without reconstruction, um, patients having post-mastectomy radiation uh, will randomize one-to-one -to, -one to conventional or hypofractionated uh, proton beam 
regime uh, radiotherapy. And the primary endpoints were complication rates at 24 months or unplanned surgical intervention. And it was assumed that the regular complication rate was about uh, 10% and the non-inferiority margin uh, was set at 10%. So just to show you quickly these results at 24 months, uh, for those having uh, 25 fractions, um, the complication rate was 14.6% uh, versus 19.5%. Uh, uh, there was actually deemed to be no um, statistically significant difference uh, between these. However, the problem was that the um, upper 95% confidence interval of 18.5 did exceed the 10% uh, limit. So generally, it was concluded that non-inferiority probably uh, was not upheld uh, based on these figures. And of course, the numbers are quite small. So um, immediate um, breast reconstruction, implant-based reconstruction is associated uh, with a significantly increased uh, rate of complications. Um, I'll skip over those results, but conventional schedules of proton beam radiotherapy can be practiced, but they are associated with high rates of implant failure in the context of immediate breast reconstruction. Hypofractionated schedules of proton beam therapy should be employed employed only within a clinical trial uh, at the present time. So I'm just going to finish there and thank you for your attention and I apologize for overrunning a little bit. Thank it's you. A, it's a great talk again, John, and a beautiful update covering all the different specialties of breast from the San Antonio. And now we have Michael Ginnand, and it's great to see Michael online. The, a big hug to Michael. He's just landed. He went from Dubai and he just landed in Qatar and he still joined us today. So it's great to see Michael. And Michael is the co-chair of St. Gallen. So what more can you ask for? You have the co-chair of a big one of the biggest conferences in the world to give us an update on that conference. Michael, the next 20, 25 minutes are all yours. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I'm trying to share my slides here. Just let me know whether that works. <clears throat> That's beautiful. Nice okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, um, here are my disclosures. Um, you know, the, the St. Gallen International Breast Cancer Conference uh, have move, has moved to Vienna in the year 2015, and it's going to stay there for the foreseeable future. And actually, uh, we were very, very happy uh, to be able to welcome St. Gallen and uh, all the faculty and the participants uh, again in our beautiful country. Vienna is not only the city of art and music, but also of breast cancer trials. And we were really happy to be able to greet more than 3,000 participants from more than 100 countries around the world. Um, we kept some of the formats from the pandemic uh, St. Gallen two years ago, um, like in having more interactivity, allowing or actually actively asking participants to suggest questions for the consensus. And eventually um, the consensus panel, which was called the largest tumor board in the world by Hal Burstein from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in, in, in Harvard, um, um, you know, this voted on more than 260 questions. So it's completely out of the question that I present all of them to you. So I have made a personal selection on, and I apologize uh, for, to everybody who would have picked other questions, but I can obviously in the discussion also address uh, some other issues. Uh, this is the 23 uh, consensus panel. It's actually the largest panel ever. Uh, more than 70 people from five continents. It's the most female panel ever, I should say, 44%. So we are approaching uh, equality here. And in fact, this was the most, most surgical panel ever. So as you can see, quite some prominent faces from the field of uh, breast surgery and breast surgical oncology. And I will also, in my presentation um, tonight, follow a, a focus on surgery a little bit. Just as a general reminder, St. Gallen is an opinion-based process. And the question is, in a given clinical situation, what would you advise for an average patient? So it's not 
for every patient. The, the votings are not for the exceptional patients. It's for the average patient, so to speak. A colleague asks you, I have a patient sitting in my clinic. What do you recommend? And, 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 and that's the, the method of discussion. So it is necessarily incomplete in, in some respect. And some of the decisions are, you know, might even be wrong. I mean, that's the, 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 the substance of the fact. Let me start with some um, items I consider interesting, uh, but from a more general practice point of view. I mean, this is a, a global consensus panel, but still with a predominance by people from the so-called Western world. And still the majority of panelists say, in my day-to-day -day practice, I regularly have situations where the cost of drug prevents my patients from, precludes my patients from, from getting the appropriate treatment. So I find this rather concerning and something to think about um, that might have been different 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, so I find it an interesting result. Another general thing, you know, burnout. I'm not burnout, but some of my colleagues are. A total of 80% of patients say either they themselves or someone in their team actually suffers from burnout which I also find a concerning uh, finding in the survey. And the clear cut reason is that the resources in the healthcare systems are not adequate uh, or are not considered adequate to master all, you know, the patient number, the patient uh, demands, et cetera. So I think that's also something to keep in mind. Another general question in patients with a body mass index of more than 25 that would include myself, I have to say, is there a specific diet that can lower it? The, no, there is no specific diet, but obviously I think there's consensus that the healthy lifestyle, particularly with focus on exercise, is good for breast cancer survivors and actually for everybody for the matter. And another interesting confirmation of, you know, a little piece of evidence that was presented in San Antonio a couple of years ago, acupuncture should be considered a treatment option for, for breast cancer in terms of treating endocrine side effects, or side effects of endocrine therapy. So I find that rather interesting because there's not too much evidence, but in clinical practice, uh, it can be useful in many cases. Um, we have already heard about the positive trial. I think uh, while the positive trial uh, is very important and in fact collected globally data on um, the difficult, the rare, but difficult situation of a young patient with a clear uh, desire for pregnancy and uh, concomitant uh, breast cancer. And many of us, I think, have started to interrupt uh, endocrine treatments, but it was never systematically assessed and recorded. And that's what the positive trial does. And I think th these results are definitive. So it is safe within the framework of the positive trial to do exactly what was there in the protocol, which is interrupt the treatment after 18 to 24 months, open a window and close the window again, uh, for example, in case pregnancy uh, was not successfully attempted. Extrapolating beyond those inclusion criteria, however, was denied by the Senkal panel. So here you can see four or more nodes, which was an exclusion criteria for uh, the positive trial, and actually St. Gallen said, no, that's too dangerous, let's not do that. Also, for a very young patient, uh, and, and breast cancer is the disease of young women in many parts of the world, um, when you're 20 years old, finish your endocrine treatment at 33 or 35, your chances for pregnancy are still excellent. Don't take the risk uh, of, uh, you know, not doing the appropriate uh, breast cancer treatment just because you desire uh, pregnancy. Let's talk a little bit about pathology and genetics. And I think uh, it was kind of interesting that the panel was uh, uh, rather conservative, uh, that may be discussed controversially, particularly in a surgical um, audience. I will lead you through this. So more or less, these are the voting results for risk-reducing surgery as the primary recommendation versus increased surveillance, for example, by uh, frequent MRIs for patients with germline notations. And as you can see, 
essentially only precurb one, both for pre and postmenopausal patient, had a clear cut maturity for yes, this is a situation where we recommend removal uh, or prophylactic removal of the breast tissue. For BRCA2, it was already less clear, so only for premenopausal patients, yes. BRCA2 for postmenopausal patients did not really have a majority. And PALP2, which, for example, people like myself would consider the next candidate germline mutation for risk reducing surgery. You know, when you look here, postmenopausal, a, a clear majority for no, and a split vote uh, even for premenopausal patients. So, not all the enthusiasm for risk uh, uh, reducing surgery that we see in some places is shared around the world. Another extrapolation, and, and, and this is just an example that consensus meetings do not necessarily yield consensus. For example, for the question, if there is no hereditary mutation, but you find a som somatic uh, uh, mutation in a given breast cancer, would you then give adjuvant olaparib? These patients were obviously not included into uh, the, the Olympia trial. Uh, and there is a clear cut split vote, so no consensus on this question. Uh, another issue of BRCA2 with ER positive HER2 overexpressing, so that's a triple positive breast cancer, also not included in the Olympia trial. Should we extrapolate to that small but existing patient population? Panel. Perfectly split, no clear cut yes or no uh, for that matter. Now let's move to some breast surgery uh, uh, results of SACA. And I think that's probably, in surgical terms, the most revolutionary vote here, because it says if you have two ipsilateral breast cancers in two neighboring quadrants, by definition, that's multicentric disease. And in a situation where you can achieve surgical radicality, by doing double tumorectomy, can we do that? And the clear cut answer is yes, we can do that. So that essentially deletes one of the previous absolute contraindications for breast conservation from the list of contraindications, leaving that list almost you know, non-existing any longer. And it confirms that breast conservation should be um, aimed at um, you know, in the vast majority of all breast cancer treatment situations. And in fact, many of us battled the, what I call the disaster of unnecessary mastectomies. And I think that's just another move towards the correct uh, 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 direction to say breast conservation. Uh, and many of us are doing this since years, if you can uh, obviously receive uh, clear margins and, and everything and, and, and a good cosmetic outcome then you can do a double breast conservation. And uh, another issue obviously was about high volume oncoplasty in, in the term the Sangan question used, I think was extreme oncoplasty. I will admit that there is a variability of the definition of that, but can, should we do that as long as the margins are clear, surgical radiation is performed, then I would add a reasonable aesthetic result can be achieved. A very clear outcome here, yes, uh, by the majority of uh, panelists. So another argument for breast conservation, um, if needed, uh, I will just dwell on very old data that we really know that breast conservation is safe. It's not worse in any respect than mastectomy. And just to fight one of the arguments I keep hearing, is, for example, for unnecessary contralateral mastectomies that are done way too many, in my personal opinion. The argument is actually the incidence of contralateral breast cancer. And when you look at the figures, these numbers are minute. So there is no indication for uh, contralateral mastectomy just because of the risk of contralateral breast cancer outside a germline mutated patient. As a matter of fact, there's only one disease in oncology where there is over survival the evidence for contralateral surgery, and that's testicular cancer. And for some reason, nobody discusses prophylactic contralateral orchiectomy. Um, so I find that a rather interesting observation when we discuss contralateral uh, mastectomy. And again, surgery, we are carried away uh, 
momentarily, and that's kind of a weird thing, which for me is difficult to understand. On one hand, we want to, as breast surgeons, de-escalate. We, we don't want to do an axilla any longer. We want to omit the sentinel. We want to reduce the type of surgery. And on the other hand, we are doing unnecessary mastectomies by the tens of thousands, uh, if you look at Europe or the, or the US, which I really find it's crazy. And I, I know that Monica Moro, uh, you know, is also an advocate for this. Next uh, voting result was actually confirmation of something that St. Gallen for the first time allowed, so to speak, two years ago, and that's re-breast conservation. So in the case of a local regional recurrence, after a breast conserving surgery and radiotherapy, so in this case, nine years ago, is breast conserving surgery plus minus uh, irradiation, if possible, additional irradiation, which probably will be the case after nine years, a clear-cut majority say yes. So a relapse is not an indication for mastectomy, just a confirmation of a result that has already been achieved um, a couple of years ago. Um, less uh, consensus is actually in the situation of local regional recurrence. Is that an indication for chemotherapy? Actually, a majority says no. There's some controversial data around that. But particularly in luminal cancer, probably the data lean towards no indication for um, another uh, chemotherapy. And there is complete confusion in terms of the appropriate hormonal treatment. If a patient uh, has a recurrent local regional recurrence while on an adjuvant aromatase inhibitor. So the suggestions uh, range from switching to another one to uh, add the CDK46, switch to full Westrand, so the, no consensus whatsoever. That's an open field. Uh, fortunately, local recurrences are not frequent enough that we will be ever be able to put together uh, a, a good uh, clinical trial for this. Interestingly, I found, um, you know, also if the calcifications on the initial mammogram are the determining factor, should you do after you have a preoperative mammogram? The majority says yes, but the significant minority, and I would actually vote for the second option personally, yes, but interoperative specimen radiography, if you have it available, obviously is an, is an alternative in order to hunt down these micro calcifications. Another surgical issue is that we obviously know that uh, being overweight uh, increases the risk for complications um, or breast reconstruction. Um, and the question was posed to the panel, you know, do we want uh, to have uh, a BMI below 30, below 35, or can we offer reconstruction even to overweight patients just when they try it and then they have achieved uh, 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 reached a stable weight? And that's obviously the majority, but a lot of uncertainty with respect to this uh, question. Also because the true evidence about the real world complication frequency after breast reconstruction, I am afraid is uh, a little bit blurry in terms of the data evidence. Still uncertainty and some of the enthusiasts will obviously uh, disagree with this vote is about uh, the use of stem cells in augmenting uh, breast reconstruction. Um, so the majority of panelists abstained, probably rightfully so, because they uh, are not experts in the field. Of those who voted, you can see that there is increasing uh, comfort, I would say, uh, with the use of, of, of uh, um, fat cells to uh, augment reconstruction. Now, obviously, the axilla is a huge uh, matter of uh, controversy, and uh, um, still some of the questions uh, needed to be answered by the, the consensus panel. Here is a question, you know, in our de-escalation hype, when can we forego sentinel surgery altogether? Uh, you see there's some majority here that, you know, in the low risk situation, stage one negative uh, axilla also by ultrasound uh, over the age of 70, small tumor, obviously favorable biology over the age of 70 would be fair. Um, again, that's uh, opinion uh, based. Another 
interesting vote was to consider an axilla negative palpation is not enough you have to use the ultrasound to be very uh, 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 affirmative about this and there is a number of trials that aim at uh, de-escalating even away from any axillary intervention and uh, my friend Oreste Gentilini uh, from Italy uh, kindly presented the first uh, results of uh, the sound trial he was doing on behalf of many, I think, who are also in attendance today. Uh, so that was a trial of patients with small tumors, negative ultrasound of the axilla. If there was something unclear, a final aspiration uh, was sought, and then these patients were randomized either to have a sentinel or no axillary surgery. And no surprise to me, I have to say, there was no difference in distant disease for survival, 97.7 versus 98%. So that's uh, identical. So one could say sound indicates that with such a patient selection, you can um, actually omit the sentinel node procedure. However, as a word of caution, we'll have to study further up the full data of the trial. Personally, I feel that we are running into somewhat similar problems, like with the initial presentation of the ACOSOC 11, C11, uh, because we don't have the uh, exact documentation of the radiotherapy. Only 40% of sound patients, as Oreste told me, uh, we have exact uh, RT documentation. And how do we exclude that, for example, in the control group, I mean, this was an open trial, multidisciplinary tumor boards and the radio service said, okay, there was no axillary surgery, whatever. Maybe I heighten up the tangents a little bit for the breast conservation, just to be sure, as we know, uh, occurred to some of the ACOSOC patients. So the books are not closed there. There's a number of trials running. The way these trials are set up in terms of selecting patients, I think it's most likely that almost all of them, if not all of them, will show that uh, that's safe. Unfortunately, I'm not so sure it helps in identifying prospectively an individual patient that sits in front of you. So there was a lot of discussion about this uh, interaction with the audience, but also within the panelists. Um, and the panel, in terms of interpreting like the ECOSOC, but also the Amaros trial, was kind of split. So here is an example. A postmenopausal patient with mastectomy and sentinel node procedure, and the one sentinel node was there. Now, the majority of panelists would say, let's proceed with radiation. Let's not go back and do an axillary dissection, which uh, I would agree. I am in the uh, luxurious situation that I always have frozen section available, uh, which prevents me from having to do another surgery. However, the general issue we have, we face, is that if we keep de-escalating surgery and in reaction to this subsequently escalate the radiotherapy, I'm not convinced that we are doing uh, uh, something good in that case. And also in terms of the long-term side effects and everything. And I think we need to fine-tune also the surgical semantics. I mean, we still have words such as axillary clearance. Who is doing an axillary clearance now? I mean, an axillary clearance when I uh, received my training meant that when I brought back less than 20 nodes, I was yelled at by my mentors. Nowadays, I think it, it's clear that that's a diagnostic procedure. It's clear that we have to protect the lymphatic vessels close to the, to the axillary vein. Uh, most, uh, many of us will preserve the intercostal brachial nerve. So, if I uh, uh, visit a, a positive node, I will do an additional, but a very selective axillary dissection, mainly because I don't want to end up in the tumor board having a discussion about adjuvant abemacyclip and not having five nodes there. But today, an axillary dissection diagnostic procedure after positive or with the suspicion of positive node doesn't mean 20 to 25 nodes with all the morbidity involved. It means five to seven to eight to maybe 10 nodes. So I think we need to reconsider the surgical semantics also. An axillary dissection in the year 2023 is different from an axillary dissection in the year 1990. Because, for example, when you look at this not too difficult case, another neoadjuvant chemotherapy patient, residual disease in the axilla, 
Now one macromet in one sentinel node, and here the panel says, I want to do an axillary lymph node dissection. Probably not clearance in, in the sense what I've said just before, but only a minority uh, uh, goes for axillary radiotherapy. So I think the image of treating the axilla, particularly post primary systemic treatment, remains a bit blurry for now. Speaking of radiotherapy, I think that's the probably uh, most important, and that's my personal view, most important vote of TCS Sankal in addition to the uh, eliminating multicentricity as an indication for breast conservation. And that's breast radiotherapy, for whatever reason you're doing it, chest wall, whole breast, nodal irradiation, use moderate hyperfractionation as the standard. So that is two and a half weeks instead of five to six weeks. I think if that would be applied globally, it's going to liberate and release uh, more than 50% of all radiotherapy resources used for breast cancer patients, urgently needed breast uh, radiotherapy resources uh, for many other uh, situations, including, for example, breast cancer patients with, with advanced stage disease. Um, ultra hyperfractionation, such as the fast forward, I believe, for a very specific and well-defined group of patients is in general accepted. But there is no more vote for you know a full six-week course of radiotherapy like we did before. So that's I believe is uh, also revolutionary. Speaking of proton therapy, in addition to availability issues, I think the panel was very clear that there is clearly no currently no evidence that that's an advantage over classical uh, photon therapy. And then there is a question of. Uh, Post mastectomy radiotherapy, um, should we do that in case there is a micrometastatic micrometastasis in one lymph node? So the clear answer is in such a situation, no. Now we make this a macrometastasis. Do we need to do post mastectomy radiotherapy with one positive node? Majority says no. Now we make these two lymph nodes and the majority changes. So uh, for two lymph nodes, that's something like the um, indicator for increased local regional risk that should, according to the panel, by majority trigger post mastectomy radiotherapy. And the situation is obviously even clearer uh, for, for, for three positive nodes. Just briefly, some of the important votes on uh, endocrine treatment. We have been discussing a lot about the duration of disease. I, I disagree uh, with, with the previous speaker, my colleague, that we should give 10 years. I think we have well defined that that's not necessary for the vast majority of patients. Uh, in the postmenopause, ABCSG16 has clarified this, I think, uh, for good, except those patients at highest risk. And in the premenopause, I'm obviously aware of atlas and atom, but I'm not convinced that uh, for patients with increased risk that in our hands will already receive ovarian function suppression, they really need to have 10 years of tamoxifen, but that may be an open question. For adjuvant endocrine treatment, the appropriate treatment duration with stage one disease is five years. So that's mainly focusing obviously on the postmenopause, but that was a very clear vote and definition by the St. Gallen panel. If it is stage two node negative disease, you see that a significant proportion of panelists starts considering seven to eight years, particularly if there was some tamoxifen in the first uh, quinquennium and rightfully so based on trials such as data, ideal or the Italian gene for uh, trial. Stage two node positive disease, well, that's now increased risk, not extreme risk. So that's seven to eight years for the vast majority. And going beyond seven to eight years really should be reserved for patients with stage three disease, or um, the highest uh, uh, risk uh, patient group, such as 10 plus nodes, et cetera. And that's almost a trivial vote. In addition to stage and all of the other things, should uh, treatment tolerability, patient preferences, and age play a role in the decision? Well, obviously, yes. Any other question I think would not be acceptable. Um, what is a little bit, uh, you know, the, the I, would, I would call it the, I would not call it a funeral, but the dawn of the multigenomic area, I think many of the votes around multigenomic tests were actually negative, 
or at least controversial. So should we use mild genomic assay to determine the duration of endocrine treatment? I know there is the, the breast cancer index data. There is some difficult to understand mammoprint data. And I recently had a controversial discussion with Laura Van Fier about that uh, at ESCO because that low risk means longer risk story. I simply don't think that uh, we really can claim that. So um, for most of the decisions, I think genomic assays become less and less popular. Um, and I think that's a good development. In closing, let me address some of the uh, miscellaneous issues. Actually, I think pushing the boundaries for a cure, now for the second time, uh, St. Gallen has said oligometastatic disease is not metastatic disease. We focus on the oligo. And for example, if there is a single pulmonary node and we get an excellent response to primary systemic treatment, we will consider this a curative, potentially curative situation. And we will obviously do appropriate uh, surgery and radiotherapy to the primary tumor. And the same uh, was done for ER negative and the same was done for triple positive and even for a contralateral axillary lymph node, if I remember correctly, uh, that was the result. Looking into the future, I think we see a lot of excellent data on uh, circulating tumor DNA, um, clearance of it during neoadjuvant is clearly prognostic of the postoperative outcome, early detection of relapse, both in the early, but also even in the late setting, there were a number of interesting presentations at DCS ASCO. However, St. Gallen remains conservative in this respect and says, well, that's not yet ready for prime time. Uh, we'll have to wait for some more data for that. As with many things, we need to keep learning. So here you see my home office. Oh no, actually it's, it's a piece of art. Um, but uh, I like it very much because that's the situation. The more results we get, the more answers we can claim, the more questions we ask. And I hope that many of the 500 attendees here will find time to join us in Vienna in March 25. Uh, and the chairman, uh, chairpersons of the conference would be very pleased to welcome you in the beautiful city of Vienna. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to uh, be able to discuss some of the issues with my friends here. That's great. Lovely talk again, uh, Mike. And can't thank you enough for that. And for people that haven't been to Vienna, we were there only earlier this month, me and my wife. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world, I think. Uh, so thank we have sent thank you. You're offending many, yes, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very beautiful. So beautiful. So <laughs> For the discussion now, we have with us Sanal Sukhun, one of the oncologists from uh, Jordan, and she sits on many committees also in ASCO. It's great to see Sana here. We have Bahadir Guluglu from uh, Turkey. He's the head of Senatürk, and he runs the Breast Istanbul, many, among many other things. That's, so it's great to have Bahadir here. I'm not sure if Nikki can join, so whenever Nikki can join, it will be great to have Nikki online. Uh, there's quite a few things in the question and answer section. It's very difficult to address all the points because this is very broad uh, webinar. So if you look at the ABS, it's mainly a surgical congress. If you look at the San Antonio, it's mainly oncology. And if you look at the San, uh, San Gallen, it's mainly a consensus, which is beautiful. But there's recurring themes and mainly axilla, margins. I think there's lots of mention of the positive trials. So we'll talk about all those things. Uh, anybody from the panelists or the speakers want to want anything specifically to start with, or shall we just go through some of the questions? Sena. Uh, you know, uh, actually, it's so interesting. Me, the medical oncologist, among great surgeons like you right. on the panel. And uh, indeed, I'd like to raise a couple of points regarding hormonal therapy. Uh, Professor Gann did a wonderful job in his talk touched on the very important uh, points regarding the myths of hormonal therapy. I'd like to emphasize a couple of things because I believe most of you as surgeons deal with hormonal therapy. Is that right? So uh, yeah. number one, actually, the issue of duration, and I'm glad uh, Professor Grant talked about the issue of duration. It's not a dogma that 10 years is the standard of care uh, these years. We do not really need molecular uh, um, classifiers to decide on long term. One thing to keep in mind, you know, I mean, the longer you use hormonal therapy, definitely you are reducing 
proportionally the risk. So if the risk is very small, yes, you will reduce it, but you will be reducing that risk by point oh something. So that to be kept in mind when considering the adverse effects and the compliance with hormonal therapy, uh, the psychological and physical cost. One more thing, it's a question I'd like to hear from the panel also, the issue of combined hormonal blockade. Um, I'm glad we have a recent meta-analysis talking about the benefit of combined hormonal blockade versus tamoxifen. And I know the soft and text used it for five years, but in reality, most patients do not. And we have the Korean data last year supporting even two years, the added benefit of even two years. So I'd like to see, I mean, uh, the surgeons on the panel, how are they uh, approaching the issue of combined hormonal blockade, talking to their patients and the duration and the complaints. Personally, as a medical oncologist, whenever it's indicated, and it's not always indicated, we know, whenever it's indicated, if the patient cannot go through five years, I feel comfortable at least pushing for two to three as much as she can and stopping because I, even, you know, with two years, I know I'm gaining benefit uh, based on the recent data from the Korean uh, study last year. Michael, so, Michael, have your hand up? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I would never argue with Sana, obviously, but, you know, <laughs> keep in mind that, the Astra trial from Korea is only after chemotherapy. So that's a little bit, I mean, many of us use ovarian function suppression instead of chemotherapy, or let's say in the absence yeah. of chemotherapy. So after chemotherapy, I agree with you. Um, you are absolutely right. We are using that for five years just because we extrapolated this from yeah. the postmenopause. And as you know, the early Austrian trials um, had yeah. used three years, yep. uh, ABCG05 and ABCG12, and not because the Austrians were particularly smart, but back then we couldn't get uh, the Solidex for longer than three years. That yeah. was the truth uh, of the matter. And we look at 95% 10-year over survival in that selection of patients. So on the other hand, so I think three to five years is okay. And if a patient gets to three years, then you can have most of the effect. On the other hand, I'm just traveling in the Middle East here, and I hear a lot of that patients cannot stand, patients cannot stand. And I think we should also fight the tendency of giving up too easily. I mean, we all together are, I think, um, in, the, in a constant argument with our American colleagues who still overtreat patients with way too much chemotherapy based on a complete misinterpretation of the RX Bonder trial because they say the intermediate risk group um, has 5%, but these patients did not receive ovarian function suppression. And as yeah. I keep saying in a provocative way is adjuvant chemotherapy for many patients in this age group is just the most cruel way of achieving ovarian function suppression. So if we use it instead of chemo, then actually we should try to get our patients to at least three years. And there's a lot of measures particularly exercise, particularly uh, nutritional factors and other things that can be done, even taking up yoga, as a matter of fact, and and I'm not an esoteric. Acupuncture, yes. Yeah. Um, so I realize it's more difficult to change a patient's lifestyle than to change a prescription. But if we um, you know, want to substitute the chemotherapy, which, by the way, has also a number of side effects, as, as everybody knows, mm -hmm. uh, then we should try to keep our patients there. But five years is probably not necessary. It's getting even worse with the new generation of trials with the certs because mm -hmm. they are going for seven years. And in premenopausal patients, they all request ovarian function suppression together with the certs. So I'm afraid that we are going to have a compliance issue in, in those trials with, with some of these durations. Can I ask you, know, Michael, one more thing? You know, I'm not very much impressed by the AI benefit above and beyond tamoxifen uh, when combined with hormonal blockade. And sometimes I find it even more tolerable to use tamoxifen for the premenopausals, and I do. So, uh, so do I. What's Absolutely your agree. On that? No, yeah, so I do I. We have, a, we have a meta-analysis from Oxford. There were four trials no. in there. The Austrian trial was going the other way. So I feel very safe, uh, unless it's a super high-risk patient. Uh, yeah. Unless it's a patient after chemotherapy, I feel very safe in doing OFS and TAM. And in fact, if I use OFS plus AI and the patient cannot stand or tolerate it, the first uh, uh, measure I take is I will change the AI to the, to the tamoxifen. So before, let's stay in the, in the endocrine 
uh, discussion, uh, Bahadir and, and Nikki, any thoughts about extended uh, endocrine treatment? Is there any certain patients, for example, that you'd extend before the, beyond five years? Do you use it routinely in the Mazdan, uh, for example, Nikki, extending beyond five years of treatment for ER positive tumors? Is there any kind yeah, of but, but no, it's just all based on risk, as, as the sort of St. Garlan data was suggesting. So most most women five years moderate risk seven years very high risk 10 years and based on their tolerability and yes we try and encourage if we think it's important but if they have bad adverse lifestyle or you know bad adverse side effects affecting quality of life then you know you have to weigh up weigh up that and is it any different in turkey for example Bahadir, how things are done well, that's the same. I mean, everywhere. When we have the patient, we discuss with our medical oncologist. In Turkey, the surgeons are not the medical oncologists, but we always consult with them. And we follow the patients together. So we saw those patients when they have the benefits from the extended treatment on hormonal treatment. But we have to select carefully those patients on the terms of their risks and the benefits that we can expect from those patients, as well as the, also the, the balance between the you know, complications, the side effects, and the benefit. So it's not too different from the practice that you see in the UK. And we'll touch a bit on the positive trial because there's lots of comments on the positive trial. The trial is not telling you that the patient that gets pregnant will not get a recurrence. It's telling mm -hmm. you that the patient that gets pregnant is not higher risk of getting more recurrence. So the risk is 10% mm -hmm. to still stay for 10%. But it's not telling you that they are not going to get a recurrence because some people are saying that, uh, yeah, people can have a recurrence and have a problem when getting pregnant. Yeah, we're not saying that they will not have a problem. They're saying we're saying that their risk is not different uh, if they get pregnant or not, as long as they fit the criteria of the study and as long as they have been compliant with the treatment before, because we know that up to 50% of people on endocrine treatment are not compliant. Any comments from any of the panelists? Can I just pick up on this issue of duration of tamoxifen in premenopausal patients? I mean, I was sort of picking up that we're not necessarily using this for 10 years, you know, but surely the majority of premenopausal, you know, hormone receptor positive, you know, patients would, would get 10 years of tamoxifen, you know, based on the uh, sort of results of the ATLAS study. It may be, may be switched to an AI as well as ovarian, you know, function suppression in the high risk group. Um, but, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think Michael and also Sana were suggesting that probably, you know, we shouldn't be sort of routinely uh, considering, you know, 10 years of um, tamoxifen. And of course, the issue around the positive trial related, you know, to this sort of 10 years of endocrine um, treatment. Any comments about all premenopausal? We're not talking about postmenopausal. No. Premenopausal. Um. I, you yeah, know, Rachana, I think the oh, sorry, Sana, go ahead. No, go ahead, Michael. I know you're gonna you're gonna read my mind. I trust you. <laughs> no, you see the, the you know the Austrian trials are more popular in Austria than anywhere else in the world, and the same is true for Atom and Atlas. I think the uptake <laughs> of the Atom Atlas message was much less outside the UK than within the UK, and. Um, you know, there's no overall survival benefit. Uh, one of the two trials never has been published uh, separately. So there's a number of issues uh, with okay. these trials. And the difference in particularly in, in, in there's no overall survival uh, difference uh, is minute. So I think in, in reality, what we are doing in premenopausal patients, if, uh, if they are high risk, that's another issue. They will have chemo, yeah, they will sure, have sure. general function suppression, right. they will have tamoxifen. And yes, if they tolerate it, then I go for 10 years. That's not an issue. But the tolerability is, we all have patients who are counting down the days until yes. the five years. Yes. In such a patient, unless she's at increased risk, I would not push for 10 years just because uh, Atom suggested that. In a patient that says, Yes, doctor, I'm taking this. I don't have any hot flashes, don't have any. You know, that is a different situation. So I think in clinical practice, beyond the scientific uh, evidence, and I say this as a physician scientist, the tolerability plays the major role in those decisions. Yeah. So, so, so probably then, you know, the issue of pregnancy 
post breast cancer in premenopausal patients may not be such an issue in your particular you know healthcare setting and perhaps you know patients should just finish five years of tamoxifen and then that'll be the end of their endocrine treatment and get on with pregnancy rather than having any formal interruption at an earlier stage well you know i agree with that for for patients below you know below the age of 35 Mm -hmm. uh, number one, they had increased risk anyway, and number two, and that's what Sangran said in a 20-year-old, mm -hmm. don't interrupt. Uh, I think if you go for 10 years and you have a 42-year-old, then that's a more yeah. delicate situation yeah. because yeah. we all know that these patients with the family planning desire, you know, individually, that's usually very emotional, uh, very strong desire and difficult to argue with. That's great. Now let's move to a different point, John. Let's talk about margins. We had the last webinar was mainly on margins and we discussed oh, yeah. things. You had beautiful talks from uh, oncologists, radiologists and uh, pathologists and uh, surgeons. Now, what I would say is a message for, because some people are asking online, if it's one millimeter, what should we do? If it's 0.5 millimeter, what should we do? If it's two millimeters, what should we do? I would say stick to whatever guidelines you use. If you're using the Syngallans or the ASCO or the ESO or the ABS, or the astro guidelines, whatever guidelines you have, you use. You need to have a guideline that you stick in the in the MDT. Any comments about that? Because if, yeah. if you if you don't stick to guidelines, then yeah. that yeah. variation in the practice yeah. can cause problems. Yeah, I, I would just also add that it's very important that people audit their results and get data on ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. I mean, ultimately, that's what's important. And obviously, you have to know your pathologist well also. I think if you're accepting, uh, you know, uh, no tumor on the ink, I mean, that's a very, very narrow margin. I mean, we were concerned in the UK, you know, about, um, you know, the sort of assessment of very narrow margins. Also, in the meta-analysis by Husami, you know, there were very a relatively small number of patients and the comparison uh, between one millimeter and no tumor uh, on the ink. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, yeah, I think at least one millimeter in my I, mind I think, is, yeah. I think arguing about margin width is, is a waste <laughs> of time, as I said, so at ABS. Yeah, yeah, I think, ABS. I think we need to, you have to, as Chip Cody said, adopt a nuanced approach. Guidelines are to help us make a decision. They're not prescriptive. So you might accept a no tumor on ink in one situation, where in another you won't. You would want one millimeter, and another you might want two millimeters. So I think we have to apply common sense to guidelines and adopt a risk adaptive approach to margins rather than obsessing about what it should be. Because sometimes you have less than one millimeter on the whole margin. You see, sometimes you have a very focal, uh, focal margin. Yeah. That's a yeah. big difference between both yes. situations. Ramsey, yes. I'm not hear you at all today. Do you have any <laughs> comments about the margins, Ramsey? You have a lovely update on the margins from the ABS uh, conference, and you had the lovely two. Uh, you were involved in the one of the on the meta analysis anyway. So, so, so thank you, Yasan. Um, so, uh, as you say. Um, the uh, my so the meta analysis um, did show uh, that close margins were associated with worse outcomes. Um, I do agree that you need to put together the whole picture though to look at the um, the absolute risk of local recurrence um, because the the risk factors. Uh, for recurrence uh, are, are, are beyond just margins alone. So tumor size, um, uh, young age, there are lots of other risk factors for local recurrence. So I think you probably do need to look at that. Interestingly, in the, in the meta-analysis we did, we also found um, an association between uh, margins, uh, close margins, uh, and distant recurrence. Um, however, the question is in, in a meta-analysis like that, how, how well we can control for all the confounding factors. We did do our very best to, to, to control as best we could. Um, so, so Mark, Ramsey, by close margins, you mean less than a millimeter, do you? Well, I'm being vague. Okay, um, so, can I just, so, can you, yeah. So, yeah okay. so, so, I mean, my, so, so in, in the recommendation in the paper was less than one millimeter. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, the, okay. the, the nice guidance is that anywhere between 
uh, greater than naught and less than two millimeters, you discuss the risk and benefit yes. of further surgery. Yeah. And we, I think that remains reasonable that you take a nuanced yeah, approach. Yeah. And yeah. we discussed that in the, in the last webinar quite a bit about one yeah. millimeter. Yeah, sure. But we're still talking about millimeters. So let's jump to something else and something that I always found very interesting about redo wide local excisions or redo breast conservation when somebody had conservation. And what we do is somebody did not have radiotherapy, it's common sense to offer them conservation radiotherapy. But people that had previous radiotherapy, uh, we see now more and more uh, cohorts of people that have redo breast conservation. Any comments on that, Bahadir? Is that something that you would consider in your local practice? For example, somebody had previous wild local excision, still reasonably aesthetically okay breast, not much radiation changes from their previous radiotherapy 10 years ago, have a small T1 uh, tumor. Will you consider redoing uh, wild local excision or not? It's not a personal issue here. I mean, I cannot take the decision by myself. I have to consult this with my radiation oncologist as well. Also, with the discussing with my patient for the you know the future. So here, what we uh, practice in our country, I mean, in our clinic, is just of course there is an option for doing a breast conserving, a redo breast conserving surgery for these patients. But at least uh, we're looking for uh, a minimum of five years of uh, you know time after the first you know surgery. So after that period, maybe we may discuss doing a redo breast conserving surgery by adding radiation treatment to these patients. But also there's a subgroup of patients who might be very old and who might be uh, omitted by radiation treatment as well. So you may go on with breast conserving surgery as well. And also in some clinics in Turkey, we have options to give an intraoperative radiotherapy. So that might be another option for these patients. So there's not an absolute contraindication for doing a redo uh, redo breast conserving surgery in these patients, but it is up to the age, uh, expectation, and also the the expectant uh, complications due to second radiation treatment to these patients. Because some people will not even discuss the option. I occasionally discuss the option with certain patients that I see the breast is still looking okay. You'll get a decent aesthetic outcome. I think the radiation oncologist will discuss with them. They'll be happy with that. I can see, John, your hand is up, but let's go to Nikki yeah. a bit. Yeah. Nikki, will you offer redo breast conserving surgery for somebody who had previous wide local excision with radiotherapy in the past, more five or 10 years ago, and has small T1 tumor? Is that something that you would consider? Yes. And I would say my colleagues on the MDT would too. You offer, you offer it. You say dogma dictates that mastectomy is the next step, but you've got a small tumor, you've got plenty of breast tissue, you know, I can do a wide excision. You can still have an oncologic or a cosmetically good outcome. You won't be able to have more radiotherapy. And, you know, people sometimes say, well, actually, do you know what? I'd just rather you take my breast off now because it's happened twice. I don't want my breast anymore. But there are plenty of women who say, you know, I would like to try that, please. Yes. Especially the ladies that we are going to, we were going to omit radiotherapy. Yeah. And that small T1 tumor that is a great one, and they're above the age of 65 or 70. There is a rule, if this was a primary in their breast, not a, not a new, new primary. We wouldn't, yeah. If they, we would not yeah. irradiate them. So why do you want to irradiate them now? Because it's a recurrence. John, you had your hand up? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask Bahadir, if patients have had intraoperative radiotherapy the first time round, can you, you know, repeat that? you know, quite easily, or even external beam radiation, if they haven't had that at the time of the initial tumour? Is well, the tissue is more resilient, you know, right, or can they yeah. tolerate subsequent well, radiation if they've had intraoperative? A, yeah, that's an excellent question, but I don't have any experience on that because, you know, you need to have a patient enough time to relapse after the first yeah. recurrence by using yeah. intraoperative, you know, radiotherapy yeah. in the first operation. Yeah. Because I, I, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, yeah. but yeah. this has to be, you know, answered by the radiation oncologist as well, because there are yeah. two options yeah. in these patients as well. A second intraoperative radiation treatment or a, you know, yeah. a conventional uh, whole breast yeah. radiation treatment after. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and a related question is whether those having ultra hyperfractionated radiation now, yeah. whether they could have subsequent, yeah. you know, yeah. radiation. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. These are very excellent questions to be answered, <laughs> but I don't know an, an, a yeah. good answer yeah. to these uh, with my with my experience so far.
Each, yeah. each of those questions can be a full webinar with two hour discussion <laughs> because we're coming now nearly to seven o'clock and I want to address one little thing because a trial that is really close to my heart is that the Z11102, which is multifocal, multicentric breast cancer conservation by Julie Dati, because I always believe that conservation is an, issue, uh, is, an, is an option. I think the key message when you look at all the publications that uh, involve your radiation oncologists, double boosts are okay. Cosmesis is okay if it's well planned. Mm, yeah. uh, but if you look at the data, though it's limited data, when they stopped doing MRI scans, they had much more recurrences because you're missing those little tumors that you want to pick out. Mm. Also, there is not much data in certain subtypes of, of, of cancer. And Michael, any comments about extreme oncoplastic or, or mainly conserving multifocal multicentric disease as a sub cohort? Any comments from that point of view? Well, I, I, I can only tell you I was very happy about this. I, I've already alluded to that 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 crazy discrepancy of on one hand we we de-escalate surgery um, to the extreme, and on the other hand, you know, we keep doing unnecessary mastectomies. So I I think we need to remind ourselves that outside uh, uh, genetic risk, breast conservation is the standard of care in the majority of all situations. I think I mean last year. And I'm in a privileged setup. You know, I have a pathologist in the OR. I have frozen section everywhere available, which I will admit makes things easier. Uh, but, you know, we can constantly keep our breast conservation rates above 90% if we use aggressive primary systemic treatment, excellent uh, interdisciplinary approaches with respect to radiotherapy, uh, clip marking, all these, these uh, things. And I think that's what we what we should do. Um, the, the only remaining indication, in, in addition to you know risk reduction in in the germline mutation, I think is really the the super extensive TCIS where where nothing is left or a completely unacceptable result. And just one more word, because I in those controversies and debates and discussions, I keep hearing it's a patient wish. I have treated 8,000 patients with breast cancer. I'm doing 35 years, and I've never met a patient who, after appropriate information, decided for a primary mastectomy. That's simply an excuse. It's the physicians who do that. And actually, there's scientific data that the, the physician's impact on the decision is 3.5 times the impact of the spouse. So let's remind our colleagues of the responsibility they have. Give appropriate information. Patients will I, not I opt for mastectomy. I completely agree. If the patient said, I want you to take my legs off, we wouldn't do it because the patient said it. So why are we so happy to do it? Because the patient <laughs> wants their breast off. It's, it's illogical. And uh, one little thing, always use your oncologist as a surgical tool. If chemotherapy will make your surgery easier, use your oncologist. That's why Sana is here, is to give all those lovely potions that shrink the tumors, make your surgery less. Ramzi, any comments about multifocal, multicentric disease and, and conservation? Um, I think beyond what's said, I, th I think the important things that is, uh, as Michael said, providing you can uh, achieve a cosmetically acceptable uh, result. You, it depends a little bit on uh, uh, what the result is from the first surgery. Uh, the other thing I would say particularly is make sure you've got agreement with the clinical oncologists, because what you don't you you want uh, it, you, you, you don't want to be in a situation where you've uh, recommended something and the it, the you, you haven't had agreement first. So I would recommend multidisciplinary discussion, uh, but particularly in the complex cases because it's now seven o'clock and we need to start closing this because we never go beyond seven o'clock. I think this is the first time we go beyond the seven o'clock. Okay. Sorry for that. Mm -hmm. Just a little comment. Uh, there's the course in Aberdeen that's happening at the end of July. Uh, I'm closing the registration next week. So if anybody's still interested, please go on the website. You'll have it on your newsletter. We have about 80 people coming. You have 20 uh, faculty members, mainly from the UK, but lots from across the world, like, uh, Alberto Lancati, you have Giuseppe and Nicola, you have Andreas. There's lots of people coming uh, along with the, 
Ashkotari, uh, Ricardo Pardo, and the usual suspects. We were wishing that Bahadir will join us, but Bahadir is not, he's in India that 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 uh, that time, hopefully in the future. Also, they have five other webinars planned. There's one on DCIS, one on implant based reconstruction, one on triple negative breast cancer, one on free flap reconstruction, and one on survivorship issues. They're all open for registration, so please look at that. You will have a certificate with your CPD points, 1.5 CPD points in the next few days. So I will send those all, all for you. Any final comments from the uh, panelists and the speakers, please? You know, yes, and last thing, since I'm the only medical oncologist, you know, our new adjuvant approach is important for us, not only to facilitate your surgery, but to actually guide our decision in terms of treatment. And this is true not only for triple negative, not only for HER2 positive, even for ER positive. Not all ER positive cancers are created alike. So a response to hormonal therapy can determine whether a patient will need a chemotherapy or not, especially when we do not have access to expensive Oncotype DX or Mama Print or whatever. Response to hormonal therapy in terms of KI67 does guide our decisions. So, so you, involve you, us, please. You need to be ready for the triple negative breast cancer webinar, Sana. So I'll, I'll contact you about that later. <laughs> Thank you all for giving up your evening, giving up the time, being with us from different parts of the world. Uh, even if you're traveling, you still joined like Michael and uh, uh, Nikki. I know you had a little issue at home also. You still joined. Tony, thanks for that. <laughs> Cannot thank Ricardo Pablo enough for all what he does for yeah, us. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank John you. Ramsey. Sana and Bahadir have been always great as usual. So for people in the States and South America, have a lovely day. For people in Europe, have a lovely evening. For Thank people you. in the Middle East and uh, further East, have a good night. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Hassan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.